when I found out um, about the severity of my diagnosis and the fact that um, the tumours were feeding from oestrogen, I was also told that it wasn't going to be a possibility for me to have any more children. And being from a large family myself, um, I've got three sisters and one brother, and I'd always dreamt of having a big family for myself because that kind of bond, the companionship, growing up with you know three sisters and a brother, there's nothing like it. Um, just, you know, a house full of laughter and love. That's what I wanted for us. And to know that it, it wasn't going to be a possibility, it, it did break my heart in a way, and I had to grieve for that loss. But as time's gone by, I actually realized how blessed I am to have my daughter Sophia in the first instance, because a lot of people don't realize, but um, chemotherapy and a lot of the cancer treatments make most women infertile and you know mean that it means that they won't most women won't be able to have any children if they haven't already by the time they're diagnosed so that just makes me feel that she's even more precious and I do look at her as my little miracle baby especially because I now know that actually when I was pregnant I my body was infested with cancer and yeah so she managed to survive the pregnancy despite the fact that I had cancer and that it was growing and yeah, she's special and I feel blessed. Yeah. The fact that even though I'm doing well with the treatment now, I'm still considered stage four and I still collect my prescriptions and right next to the drug is written when they say indication, what's the reason for the drug, they write palliative because the doctors believe that, you know, stage four is stage four, you can't go back and they believe that despite the fact that I'm responding to treatment and healing, they think it's just a matter of time before the cancer mutates um, and the drugs stop working and it starts to grow again. So that's the thing with stage four, that the reason why it's um, the prognosis is so bad is because cancer is so smart that what happens for most people is that yeah, they respond well to the first drug, but then the cancer mutates and changes, so the drug stops working. Then they go on another drug, and yeah, it works, but then the cancer changes and it stops, and that happens until you run out of options. So I am, from a doctor's perspective, always stage four, and I'll, I'll never come off treatment, I'll never stop having scans, because from their perspective, they're just waiting for the treatment to fail. Um, How do you feel about that? It's hard to, it's, it's hard because I, I, I on, on good days, I have a lot of faith and a lot of hope and I'm, you know, I tell myself I'm not a statistic and I'm going to be, I'm going to beat the odds, I'm going to be a special case, um, but on other days it's, it's, it, it, it's hard when you're a person, especially of a scientific background and you look at the data and 80% of people, yeah won't be here in a few years time that 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 is hard um so i i fluctuate some days i feel strong and full of faith and hope that i'm going to be special and live a long life but there are dark moments where i you know when you're constantly being told it's just a matter of time that does seep in sometimes yeah are your fears around say your husband caring for your daughter or not being around for your daughter yeah how are those feelings yeah. now my, my fears are uh, most of the time day to day I can cope really well because I think a I'm here right now there's no point in worrying or causing problems when actually right now we're blessed we have each other um, and you know what will be to an extent will be um, but what the worries are are around just the idea of a young girl growing up into womanhood and not, I guess my worry is about her not having the love of a mother and what that does in terms of boosting self-esteem, self-belief, um, just that cosy feeling that we of home that we all have when we're with our, with our loved ones and our mum. And I know that my husband, my sisters, my mother, and the whole of our family would do a wonderful job if I weren't here, but it does still sting to think that 
the statistics say it's more likely that I'm not going to see my daughter into her teenage years. Um, that hurts. Um, but sometimes I do also think we are all on our own path in life and I can't live her path and her life for her. We all have our challenges and struggles and I hope that that's not something she has to face, but that's life. So a lot of people don't realise that actually a lot of relationships and marriages don't survive a cancer diagnosis. You might think that it brings people together and I think it does in the short term, but in the long term it can be a real source of stress and strain in so many different ways. So there is actually evidence which shows that um, a large proportion of relationships break down because of cancer. Um, so like, for example, in my situation, it has affected our relationship in so many ways. Um, I'm incredibly lucky that my husband is supportive and loving and that we have a good foundation, but just take, for example, our sex life. Um, I'm in the menopause, um, so that obviously goes with reduced libido and a lot of physical changes and I have one breast and fortunately we're both committed to having an open dialogue and communicating about those sorts of things but it's not easy to talk about this sort of thing as a young couple who's, you know, we've been married for three years but this is, this is not what you expect to be dealing with at this stage in your life. Um, so yeah, it takes work and dialogue and <laughs> tractor, sorry. Um, so so in terms of intimacy and the sexual side it has an impact, it also has an impact financially. Um, so most people when they have cancer diagnosis they'll be off work for a period of time um, and that has placed additional financial pressure on my husband. Fortunately he has well paid job and was the breadwinner and um, I've been fortunate to have other cover but financially but a lot of people don't and that is another strain finances and if I'll ask you and the listeners another question back if you were told that odds are your partner's not going to be here in three years time and that over 80% of people aren't going to be here in a few years time how would you look at your partner and your future with them a lot of people may check out yeah no. i was going to say so are we talking date nights in terms of how you so, keep your relationship yeah. strong yeah what are some of the so i'd say the other pressure is having a young baby anyone who has a young child knows that that also takes its uh, toll on a relationship um, so the things that we've done to kind of uh, protect are, yeah, things like date nights, asking grandparents who we're fortunate live locally to take our daughter um, for a time. But also just, we have, we don't have a specific name for it, but we have like little check-in sessions where we'll talk about uh, issues or problems that have come up and ways that we can both compromise and improve things for the other person because yeah relationships and marriages take work they're not easy so particularly so a specific example when I had my mastectomy um, that meant that my husband took on all of my duties in terms of I couldn't lift so when you have your breast and, and your armpit operated on you can't lift and our daughter is she was a toddler at that stage so potty training, I couldn't lift her onto the potty, so cooking meals, doing potty training, taking her to and from nursery, all the cleaning in the house, on top of going to work. And as much as he's a loving and supportive man, when your workload, you know, doubles overnight, you're tired and you're exhausted and any, I think, human being would, you know, get a bit drained. And that happened. And so... For example, one of the things that we did at that time was I went to go and stay with my mum for a week to just give him a little bit of a break and some respite. And I hate, and you know, I couldn't even get myself in and out of the bath. I would have to call him to, particularly because after the operation I had drains coming out of my chest. Um, and I would, 
I couldn't sort of push up and in and out the bar. So I would go in, he'd have to come and put me into the bar and get me out. Um, and after having my ovaries removed, I couldn't, because I had four incisions into my abdomen, I couldn't literally get up and out of a chair. So I was laying on the sofa and I couldn't reach my water. I couldn't give myself my painkillers, my medications. I take a lot of medications every day for the cancer. Um, so he would have to set alarms on his phone to remind me and you don't expect to be caring for your partner as if they were an elderly person and a lot of the time, not a lot of the time but sometimes that is the state that I'm in and I don't, I'm not a person who dwells on that side of things so I share my story on Instagram and my day to day life on Instagram but I do probably show more of um, the times where I'm resilient and where I'm able because I don't like to dwell in negativity and focus on the things that I can't do, I like to focus on the things that I can do but sometimes that doesn't really reveal the day to day grind and the reality of, of what it's like to be, you know, a 30 year old woman whose husband is lifting you in and out of the bath or giving you your cancer medications or you know yeah there's 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 a lot that goes on that unless you live it you won't really realize but it takes its toll and to this point fortunately we are managing really well um, but we have spoken about you know if things aren't if we're not coping as well as we are, would we need to go and speak to somebody to get support? Um, and that is something that you know we're open to in the future if if we're not coping. You know?